What's happening everyone? My name is Devin from Debo's Fishing and today I'm here to talk to you about five tips to help you on your way to airbrush painting fishing lures. Now these are things that I've learned on my own from trial and error, uh, some other things I've learned from other painters, nice enough people in the community to help me out and I want to pass that along to all of you to help lessen that curve because listen you're gonna paint your first lure and think oh my gosh I, I can't do this but just like anything else airbrush painting just takes consistent practice so tip number one is learn your airbrush and the controls so the airbrush that I use is the Iwata Eclipse there's a bunch of different options out there some have triggers underneath this is pretty standard this is what you call a dual action airbrush meaning when you press this button down it's gonna shoot the air out when you press it down and then pull it back that's going to shoot your paint out. So most of them are going to be set up this, like this. Um, pick up a decent airbrush. There's some of the real uh, cheap airbrushes out there that are just a pain to clean because every time you're switching colors in here, you have to clean this. That's something to keep in mind. Uh, but get a decent airbrush, a dual action like this, and you'll be well on your way to starting. Now, the reason I like these dual action airbrushes is because the biggest, most important thing that I learned when you're starting out is to always have your air on. Here, let me grab this. So as I'm painting, I'm always going to keep my air down, pushing it just like this. And then as I need paint, I'm going to start to let it out by pulling that back. So remember, just this is air, pushing it down and pulling it back is where you're going to get your paint. Now the reason that's so important is because when I get to step two, you have to learn the big three factors, which is going to be your air pressure, the distance from the target or the crankbait that you're painting, and then your speed. Those are the three things that are gonna change the look of the paint when you spray it on. Your air pressure, the distance, and the speed. So what does all that mean? Well, a higher pressure uh, for me is usually like 30, 35 PSI when I'm putting on like a primer uh, or if I'm just covering a whole lure in one color, I'm usually gonna use that. I'll also have to use a higher pressure on paints that are a little bit thicker. Now the awesome thing about what Do It has done with the Bait Blast paint is that it's ready to go out of the bottle. So your primary colors, maybe the only one you might have to thin a little bit is the pearl, um, which means it's got little flakes of like silvery flashy stuff in there. And it's just a little bit thicker paint, but all the rest of the paints are ready to go out of the bottle. Of course, you always wanna make sure you shake them up good, but ready to go out of the bottle so there's minimal uh, thinning and you know messing with the paints because when you're starting out, you just wanna put the paint in and go, right? Now when you're on that higher pressure, you also don't want to get too close to the target you got to remember a higher pressure means there's more powerful air coming out of there so if you get real close to the target and you're moving real slow remember speed you're gonna have spider webbing effect where you spray the paint like that and it gets all these little fingery looking things not good on a lure you're gonna get globs you're gonna get running it just doesn't look good so you want to make sure when you're using that higher pressure you're gonna have to get just a little bit farther away and you're probably gonna have to go a little bit quicker now on the opposite end of the spectrum, when I work at a lower pressure, so when I'm working between 15 to 20 PSI, uh, that's gonna be for paints that are a little bit more watery. So the thicker paints, I usually think of like melted ice cream, kind of that consistency. Uh, paints that are thinner are gonna look almost like whole milk, a lot more watery, right? And I have to use a lower pressure because if I use a higher pressure with really thin paints, I'm just gonna shoot paint everywhere and it's gonna drip and it's gonna be awful. So. Lower pressure means I'm gonna usually be working with thinner paints, and that lower pressure allows me to get closer to the target so I can make smaller dots. I can make finer lines. I can get all that detail work by working with that thinner paint on a lower pressure, and then from there it's just speed and trigger control. And speaking of trigger control, I completely recommend working on that before you start painting. Any you know crankbaits or anything, working on paper draw out some lines with a pencil or pen uh, draw some dots to practice that you know with uh, small lines then backing up learning how that distance really comes into play um, just messing with it on paper and using your airbrush is really how you're going to grasp that air pressure distance and speed now in addition to your airbrush when you're painting your lures a couple things that come in handy are these holders so this is from flex coat this is just like a little almost i've actually used like an exacto knife holder that's essentially what this is that allows you to paint your lure like this. As you're spraying it, you can turn it, move it. Those are pretty handy and I use those quite a bit. Now you can also use these, especially for your larger lures. These are called helping hands, get them off Amazon. Uh, but I think they're made for like soldering and stuff, but uh, they come greatly in handy for 
painting like this, you can turn it, move it, make sure you're even. That way you can hold your baits and then set them aside and let them dry. So definitely check out some of those to, uh, to hold your lures. Okay, tip number three is make sure you keep your airbrush clean. Now this is so important, kind of like I said before, is you wanna make sure you've got a decent little airbrush that you can keep clean. That little reservoir, that little hole there is what I'm cleaning usually between every time that I switch paint. So for example, if I put on a, a white base coat, a primer, and I need to go over to a, like a black or a dark blue or something, I've gotta clean that up because otherwise the paints are gonna mix in here. And that's not gonna be good because you're not gonna get a good, sharp, crisp color, whatever that second color is, they're gonna kinda of mix together. Now how do I clean my airbrush in between? Let me show you. Okay, so my process for cleaning this out is pretty simple. Um, I got one of these paint pots. It's nice because when you spray the paint in here, it's got a little filter so stuff's not going everywhere. Of course, you want to have proper ventilation. This is my little paint booth. Um, it's something you can get on Amazon. You just have to run a, uh, well here, let me show you real quick. You run a tube out your window or through some vent to make sure it's venting these fumes out. You do not want to have all of this in an enclosed room. Um, though I am using a water-based paint, not an acrylic, it is not something you want to be breathing in. So make sure you have proper ventilation. Now, cleaning this out, you want to get your excess uh, paint out of here. So it goes in here, you can start spraying this out. Now, I've got a little cleaner deal. This is just an old thing I have because it's got a little squirty top. Squirt some of that in there, and then I'm going to do just a little bit of a back blow. Now, I've got some of these uh, dish towels that aren't fibrous, so I'll put my uh, tip here. Hold it and then blow some of that paint out. Now I've got another waste basket here next to me. Actually, it's a little Tupperware thing. I'm gonna throw all that excess paint in, then I'm gonna come back here. You can see I spilled over the front a little bit. I'm gonna take this towel because it's not fibrous. It's not gonna get a bunch of little hairs and everything all over it. I'm gonna clean out inside of there. Now I'm just gonna rinse and repeat until this little cup is nice and clean. So again, I'm gonna spray some of that in there, spray a little bit in. That way I'm getting through to the needle. I'm gonna back blow just a little bit of that. Dump the rest in here and repeat this, uh, I don't know, usually three or four times until it's nice and clean. And then once you can blow nice, clear water through that or cleaner or whatever and you don't have any paint showing up, you know you're good to go. Make sure you clean off the excess. You don't want to accidentally drip or rub it on anything. Get all that cleaned off. And another thing to remember at night when you put this away is always clean this out nice and well. I always take my uh, needle out of there and that's really easy to do on this. Like I said, it's the Iwata Eclipse. Take that back part off, take this off, and your needle comes out nice and easy. So I'll clean off my needle, and then as I leave this to sit overnight, I'll undo the uh, air deal here. They've got these quick connect things, which makes it really nice uh, if you're just starting out, because you take this off, you can clean it. So I'll take this off, I'll put some cleaner in here just like that, and then leave it set in here overnight. Now you don't want to leave this a long time. If there's any paint or anything in there, it can kind of uh, become like a, a jelly. Uh, but I'll do that, leave it in there. The excess is gonna drain out into it. You just wanna make sure it's nice and clean before you put it away. Don't leave any paint in there that can harden and get gross because then you'll have to take all this apart. It just becomes a headache. Now the other big thing about keeping a clean airbrush is it's gonna mean consistent flow. And what I mean is if you let any sort of dried paint or globs or anything get in there, you're gonna hear like a whistling sound when you're trying to paint. It's gonna splatter out so it's not gonna be in a good clean line. It'll be kind of like spitting. Or you might get to a point where you're just barely pulling on the trigger and no paint's coming out at all. You might have what's called tip drying where a little bit of paint starts to dry on the tip of your airbrush and you have to clean that off. So you have to keep in mind, this is one machine, you have to keep the whole thing clean and working right because you know if your tip's not clean or if you've got paint down in the middle of it, it's gonna affect the whole process. Okay, tip number four. After you've practiced and you've got used to your airbrush and you've started painting lures, the big thing to remember is layers. Think of all the lures that you're painting in layers because you can always add more paint, but you can't take paint off. Um, small, thin layers gradually building up the paint on your lures is gonna look a whole lot better. Now, you know, I'm not a master at this. I've been doing it for a few years and I still have a lot to learn, but one thing I've certainly learned is you'll be a lot happier when you go in lighter coats, especially when you're trying to blend or use multiple colors. It just turns out so much better when you glob a whole bunch of paint on and try to put paint over that. It's harder to cover up certain things. It's harder to, um, you know, meld those colors into each other when you're trying to gradually transition. Otherwise, it's gonna look like somebody took a marker and went red and then right below it went green right it's a hard you know spot they just meet up it doesn't look good a tip number five the last tip is don't be afraid to experiment with stencils nettings 
really anything you use in day-to-day -day can change and give different looks to the lures that you're making. So anything like this, this is like part of an old, you know, net laundry deal. Also, as you start to paint lures, you're going to get a lot of stencils. There's, uh, you know, stuff you can get from Do It. Uh, there's stuff you can get all kinds of places. Uh, and with stencils, you're really going to open up what you can do because it's not just solid colors. Uh, you know, you're getting patterns, you're getting textures, things that look more like a fish. Um, now the thing you want to remember with all these is whenever you're using any of this, you know, netting type stuff, stencils, the closer uh, and tighter you can get it to the lure, the better and sharper that is going to look. So if you're putting down, you know, stripes or fish scales or whatever, the tighter and closer to that lure you can get it, the better and sharper it'll be. If it's not completely tight or you've just got a stencil that's kind of halfway on, halfway off, it's going to look shadowy. It's not going to look real, you know, bright and vibrant. Sometimes you might not want that, but just keep in mind if you want those lines to look sharp, lay that stencil on, get it as close as you can. And again, work in those gradual layers because if you just a whole bunch of paint on there, it's going to splatter, it's going to run all kinds of problems work in gradual layers. Now what I mean by that, if we actually look at a lure that I painted, see how it's got that nice kind of crackly uh, black underneath there? The way you achieve that is through, you know, painting this uh, blank completely black, right? And that's going to leave what's underneath there. Then you wrap that lace over it and get it nice and tight. If you don't get it nice and tight on there, it's going to leave blurry lines. It's not going to look good. So as we can see here, nice, good, clean black lines. That's what you want. Same thing when you're using like a stencil that you would just put on the bait. So you can see here, I put that stencil nice and tight to the lure. It left a really nice clean line. Now, as I got down toward the bottom of it, I didn't make as much contact. So I would take this and just kind of leave it barely up off the blank like that and spray through. That's going to give you kind of that shadow effect where it's kind of fading down into the bottom of it. You can get different effects, but again, if you want to get those good, clean, hard lines, you need to make sure that stencil is tight onto the blank where you spray it. Or if you're using any of this netting or anything, you want to make sure you get it nice and tight on here. And the way I do that is I clip the netting to it. So I got these off of Amazon. I don't know. They cost, you know, next to nothing, but you're going to pull this tight and then use these clips. I like these because they've got a little rubber on the bottom. So when you clip them on, you got to be careful because uh, pretend this is, you know, white under here, just a primer. You want to be careful because when you put that on, you don't want to scratch your white primer. So you get that pulled as tight as you can on there. Use your clips to hold it and put clips all the way around it. It would look like this. You end up with something like that. You see how that's nice and tight all the way around. So again, that's just like a, a piece of lace from a hamper or something, and it's going to leave a really cool scaling effect, but you have to make sure you've got it tight all the way around. So you can use like these little alligator clips, all kinds of different stuff you can use, but just make sure it's nice and tight to the lure like that. Now, speaking of lures, I'm also excited because Do It's going to have their own actual crankbait bodies available. I think they're going to have 30 different bodies available uh, later this fall. So that's everything that I've been painting on lately to test them out. Uh, loving them so far. Can't wait to get my hands on some more. All right, everyone. Those are my five tips to helping you on your way to airbrush painting crankbaits. And remember, none of this is going to happen overnight. That's the biggest thing that I had to learn. Uh, it's going to take time, practice, you know, with your trigger control, um, you know, messing with the, uh, the air pressure, the distance, your speed. All that's going to come into play. And the more you learn it and the more you work at it, the quicker you're going to get better at it. Now again, huge shout out to Do It for putting the time and work in to get these paints right. I was involved in the process for quite some time, months of testing with this. They listened to the feedback and it's really paint geared just towards painting fishing lures uh, and anglers, you know, colors that anglers use, colors that anglers want, uh, you know, not just a bunch of random stuff and hoping it's good. They really kept fishing in mind. So big thank you to Do It for allowing me to be part of the process of developing these paints. Now, speaking of the paints, you can find the, uh, the new Bait Blast paints on the Do It web website. Uh, they have your regular primaries and the fluorescence coming in at 1050 for four ounce bottles. Not a bad deal. Now they also have their iridescent and pearl paints, which are $11.95 for a four ounce bottle. Check them out. Uh, like I said, I've been using them for the past few months. Part of the development process, I mean, I've got super old stuff here in the old bottles, which is awesome because they didn't put this stuff out till they got it right. So check it out on the Duo website. I'm super excited to see what other colors and creations they come up with. But that's enough for me today. Again, I hope this helped you all out. My name is Devin from Debo's Fishing. Thank you all for watching and until next time.